Hello and welcome to another episode of The Glittering Bell Jar. I am one of your two hosts. I'm Valerie. And I'm Bree. Hi, Bree. How are you today? I'm good. I'm good. I cannot believe it is, um, it's not our last episode, but it's the episode, last episode of the book. How are you? I know. I feel like I'm good. I will say, I feel like it is our last episode. And then the next episode next week is going to be a bonus episode. That's kind of how it feels in my head because it's so different than these episodes. In fact, I have no idea how it's going to go because we don't (laughs) really have our books in front of us and our notes and we're going to be watching films separately and coming back together. But Anyway, I have a really fun story. You want to hear it? It's Harry Potter related. Of course. Okay. So uh, my husband runs a residential cleaning business and we were cleaning someone's unit yesterday, which we don't normally do, but it's been a really weird time with people getting like spring flus and COVID and stuff. So we've been helping out and I went into this property and there was some stuff still there. And the person who owned the property was like, you can just throw everything away. And what was laying on the floor was a copy of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And what's crazy is that if you take a look, look how sun bleached my copy is. (laughs) I I had no idea that the letters on the front of our copies of Harry Potter were red because mine are literally not red anymore. They're white. They've been completely bleached. The only part actually now that I see it that's red on mine still is the JK Rowling bit at the bottom because that part would have been like under the edge of a bookshelf or something. Anyway, all this to say, I got a free copy of Deathly Hallows and I was thinking that as Ooh. part of our prize pack, we could sign this copy and send it Aww. to the winner as part of the pack. So like you, I mean, I know it's just an extra copy of Harry Potter, but if you're listening this much and you win the prize pack, clearly you love Harry Potter. And I admit it is a used copy, but It's in better condition than mine is, so that's got to count for something, right? (laughs) I think that is a very cool idea. I love that. That'll be one of the items in the prize pack, obviously. Yes. But then you have a signed copy by two people who did not write the book who just spent (laughs) a lot of time talking about it. (laughs) A lot of time. Very cool. Anyway, my week has been very busy as a result. (laughs) That's like one of those things, like uh, you eat, sleep, breathe something. It's just the world just keeps bringing you more of it. That's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. And she was just like, you can just throw it away. And I was like, can I have it? And she was like, um, yes. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> I'm not throwing away. This is a perfectly good book. It's like, it's like a $35 book. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah, thing has to be really tattered away. up for me to throw it away. It would feel wrong. Yeah. And as a Harry Potter book, that's literally never going to happen. I mean, right. they're going to fall apart before that. I want to be buried with mine. I told Jacob that a long time ago, Jacob being my husband. He's like, really? I'm like, yes. Except I don't want to be buried. I want to be turned into a tree. But we're totally on a different topic at this point. <laughs> Whole other thing. <laughs> All right. So let's jump into it, right? Because okay. we have four more chapters. Uh, these chapters, thankfully, are much shorter than last week's. Though yeah. last week's episode didn't end up being much longer than the average length that we have. So, you know, we did a pretty good job of keeping keeping moving through a very long section of the book. But this week yeah. we have four more and then we are done. So... If this is your first episode of The Glittering Bell Jar, welcome. You're a little bit behind, (laughs) a little bit by a lot, but actually what would probably be really interesting is to listen to the podcast backward now that you are starting with the end of the podcast, aka the beginning (laughs) of the book, but we could do a podcast about our podcast or something like that. No, getting too meta. The way it works is that we are reading Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows backward this season. So if you are starting with us today, you should go back to episode one and start there because that's the back of the book and you'll catch up. You'll have lots of time to binge and catch up with us before you get back to this episode as we wrap up Deathly Hallows. When we read the book, we start by reading the last sentence of the chapter and then reading the whole chapter and then going backward a chapter. And then when we talk about it during the podcast, Brie gives us a synopsis. I read the last sentence aloud for everyone and then we discuss. So with that, Let's just jump right into the first chapter we're covering today. All right. Chapter four, The Seven Potters. It is the night that Harry must leave the Dursleys' house. He'll be turning 17 and the house will no longer protect him. The order has come to safely deliver him from the Dursleys to the Weasleys' house. Six of the order, Hermione, Ron, Floor, Mundungus, Fred, and George, all take Polyjuice Potion, so there will be seven Potters to be escorted out of the house, much to Harry's dismay. As soon as they all take off by broom, Thestral, and motorbike, they are swamped by Death Eaters. In the attack, Sweet Hedwig is instantly killed. Harry almost plummets to his death, 
when the sidecar he is in separates from Hagrid's motorcycle and Hagrid jumps off the bike to save Harry from a Death Eater. Just as Voldemort finds Harry, he barely makes it to the protection of Ted's house and uses Accio spell to summon Hagrid. Or Accio, we're going to have all episode on that, but regardless, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And the last sentence of this chapter is, Harry pulled hard at the handlebars to avoid hitting Hagrid, groped for the break, but with an ear-splitting, ground-trembling crash, he smashed into a muddy pond. Hmm. That was yeah. quite This the, chapter uh, was really, event. really dramatic. Yeah. I was really sad about Hedwig this time. I was too. And I forgot how different it was. I think we had talked about it before, but I, I forgot how different really this entire scene was from the book or from the movie, but especially like Hedwig, he's just like stuck in his cage and he just gets like hit just kind of like a bad thing that happened. A miss, you know, they were trying to get Harry and they got Hedwig. Yeah. I did notice that too, that this was, this was, she really took a hit that was aimed at Harry and, ha and Hagrid. Like there mm -hmm. was no doubt that that spell would have hit one of them. Mm -hmm. if not for Hedwig having been in that scene. Though in the movies, as you say, and I'm sure we'll discuss next week, among many things we note, she's out on the wing. She's flying and she basically sacrifices herself to protect Harry, which is a very different scene than we're seeing in these chapters where Hedwig's been really mad at Harry, kind of like we talked about last episode with Lupin, where mm -hmm. Lupin was just in a bad mood, bad mood, bad mood, and then Harry and Lupin get into a fight. Like this one, all of these chapters today with Hedwig, she's not happy with Harry. And it's a really sad end because they didn't have any special moment together. Um, and it really underscored for me our conversation last episode where you said, you know, sometimes all you can do is just take consolation in the fact that you gave your pet a really good life while you had them. But I, I was deeply moved by that in a way I hadn't been before. And I have no doubt it was because of our conversation last week. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Was gonna say that's that's a very good point and yes it, i was also a very moved by this just her her dying even though she was just sitting there it was i don't know yeah mm -hmm. very sad it was almost more dramatic and traumatic in the book because it is so much out of harry's control and and hedwig has no agency she's purely a victim and that yeah. is one thing i think does get represented equally in the film and the book that we haven't watched the film yet is the chaos of this scene as they all come into the middle of a battle rising up out of Privet Drive. Uh, that is very clearly brought to the silver screen and very well described in the book. Yeah, that's fair. So let's jump to the front of the chapter, try and go in okay. a little bit of order. I thought this chapter was very interesting because it opens just after the Dursleys have left Privet Drive for the first time. They're driving away and Harry is alone in the house for the first time that we've ever seen. Now he's wanted to be alone in the house before when he was a small child, but he is just hanging out in the house by himself. He shows Hedwig where he used to sleep under the, in the cupboard under the stairs. He mm -hmm. remembers the memory of telling uncle Vernon about the flying motorbike memory and the flashes of green light. Yeah. But the one sentence that this whole thing that jumped out at me is this sentence that reads, it gave Harry an odd, empty feeling to remember those times. It was like remembering a younger brother whom he had lost. Yeah. Which is exactly how I feel whenever I end Deathly Hallows and try and go back and read Sorcerer's Stone right away. They're almost two different people. They're so far apart. This hero's journey is so long. That is a really accurate description of how I think a lot of audience members, especially really big fans that read the books over and over, must feel when they reach the end and have to go back to the beginning when those stories are connected back together. Hmm. I like that. I guess you're right. It does feel like that. It does feel very, yeah, like, just almost like two separate series. Mm -hmm. Two separate people for sure. Two separate characters mm -hmm. yeah. because young Harry is so naive and sweet and innocent. And this Harry, even at the beginning of this book is such a mature and burden laden man Mm -hmm. And he's so confident too, seeing him stand up to Vernon um, and seeing him, the way he looks at things and, you know, he's looking at his closet and it is quite different than obviously what we see in the first book, um, mm -hmm. which is a much, you know, just a young child who doesn't have the confidence, who doesn't know all these amazing things and also hasn't gone through all the things that Harry's gone through, but mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
it was it was very very sad honestly i feel like these entire four chapters were kind of a bummer <laughs> Like, mm-hmm. which is wild because this book has been nothing but sadness. But for me, these four chapters were kind of depressing. I don't know if you felt the same way, but I was like, man, I don't even know what to write down. I'm just so bummed. Yeah, I don't have as many notes in this set of chapters as I have in many past chapters. And I think part of that is tonally, this is setting the stage for everything to come. This yeah. is a dark, we are in a very dark chapter of the magical world of Harry's life. And it feels that way. There's a lot of heaviness. There's reminiscences, but they're bittersweet. They're never, you know, they're never really that sweet, fond memory. I mean, there's that scene in, I think it's the chapter, chapter three, which we'll cover in a minute where, you know, (laughs) Vernon says, you know, I think you're trying to get the house. And Harry's like, for for all the good memories, like, what are you talking (laughs) about? This place is awful. I don't want to be here. Nobody wants to be here. (laughs) Yeah. Um, one thing that I did want to discuss, you might remember a few episodes ago, we were talking about the Fidelius charm. I think it was probably episode 11 or episode 12. And I was like, you know, it's really interesting how there's this magic that needs certain conditions to work properly. And I was like, and there's another spell I'm thinking of that I can't remember. I remember not remembering. That's what I remember. (laughs) This was that spell, the spell that protects Harry in the house the way that all the conditions must be just so for the magic to work properly is really fascinating to me. Um, And I didn't double check it because I don't, I'm trying not to open the previous books unless I know exactly what I'm looking for, but Mm I am a little bit confused as to whether this magic was set up by Dumbledore or whether it was established by Lily Potter, because we know Lily protected Harry through his blood but I, but in this chapter and the one before, they're talking about how it's Lily's charm that's protecting Harry because it's her family. But I thought it was Dumbledore who cast the charm that does that protecting. I can't really remember. I also think you're right. I do think they're calling it Lily's, which is kind of confusing because she also protects him through her blood, like you said. But that's different. That's how Voldemort, it's harder for Voldemort to see inside Harry's mind because it hurts him. Um, but yes, I, I thought it was... Dumbledore who set the charm because of the link between Lily's blood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm glad you remember it the same way. Yeah. But this is one of those, another one of those kind of deep magic things we were talking about. That's just, it has to have all these pieces come together Mm -hmm. in just the right way that almost can't be reproduced. And I find that a fascinating part of magic that is never explored because everything we learn in the series is all academic and, you know, written in textbooks. And there's magic here as is said in the books that has never been seen before. And it's because of the weird way all these variables came together with Harry and Voldemort and his, you know, attack on the baby. Right. It's so true. There's so many interesting, like, I feel like we could sit here and talk about all the weird circumstances that made up, well, really the entire series. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we've covered a lot of them. Fidelius charms and the weird, unique way they work. I had Vila magic last week I was curious about. It's, yeah. it's there's a so, so much bigger of a universe. I really actually, we're going to cover it later, but I really want to read The Life and Lives of Albus Dumbledore. And I am yeah. all for that part of the magical world being created just to serve the fans. Like, I feel like a lot of Harry Potter stuff is getting licensed right now. And like, it's everywhere write that book. Like it doesn't need to be 900 pages, but I would love to read that one. It, it needs to be 900 pages and I want to read it. All. I would love it. To, if it <laughs> I would read it. But, um, another thing. And I really, I feel like this is a great one where maybe people in the audience have been like, you dummies, why can't you remember this? When Moody pulls out his flask of polyjuice potion to make the seven potters. Uh-huh. All this time we've been like, polyjuice potion. Where'd that polyjuice potion? Oh. Why did Matt Moody have polyjuice potion? Oh yeah. It's because of this scene. Moody's made Polyjuice <laughs> Potion specifically to help oh. Harry escape. And I'm like, if you read it in forward order, you don't even think about it. But when you approach it backward, you're like, what? Why is there Polyjuice Potion in this whole section of the book? And this is why. Oh. <laughs> I was just like, oh, right. Yeah. Anybody who knows the book really well would be like, guys, it's the Seven Potters. <laughs> yep. You're right. Okay. Well. Goes to show I don't know everything about the Harry Potter series. <laughs> I try. Almost, though. Almost. I won't forget that one now. I'll I'll never get that out of my brain. Yeah, it's in your brain forever, cemented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What Um, else do you have in this chapter? Yeah, you know, the rest of the things I have are really small and like funny. So if you have any more heavy things, I'm happy to cover those first. Um, I do have one more. It's right at the end of the chapter. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, that's Uh, go ahead. It's fine. 
Okay, so the last thing I had is in the final battle between Voldemort and Harry, before mm-hmm. Harry crosses the barrier, the protected barrier, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about this, another deep magic, where Voldemort is attacking Harry and Harry's wand does its own magic. Because again, magic we've never seen before. I kind of wondered if what happens in this scene is that Voldemort does in some ways possess, either possess Harry's mind or Harry enters Voldemort's mind. And the magic that Voldemort, like the act of casting a spell, which is what Voldemort is doing, is what Harry does mimicking it in the connection that they have. Like, I don't think Harry does it consciously, obviously, but the way it read is, as the pain from Harry's scar forced his eyes shut, his wand acted of his own accord. It's almost like when he has a vision of Voldemort. And when he has Mm -hmm. visions of Voldemort, he, in his mind, is Voldemort. He's acting the same way. Uh, Okay, so doesn't he... In that line, I was confused about that. Is he casting a curse back at Voldemort? Does it it stops it, right? Because isn't he that what they talk a spell. about? Right, a spell he says he doesn't even know. Right. So you're saying it's the magic of their minds instead of the wand being connected to Harry. Mm-hmm. Oh. I think it's more to do with because Harry. Like when he has visions of Voldemort, his, he's in extreme pain in his scar and his eyes are closed. I think mm-hmm. it's more to do with the connection between Harry and Voldemort than with the wands and the wand lore. Because it isn't Voldemort's wand. It's Malfoy's wand. It's Lucius Malfoy's wand. So the right. connection between the twin cores has already been established. Like that magic exists. This is something to me that seems very different. That's fair. I Yeah, that very well could be it. I think it could also be like an innate subconscious magic inside Harry. Like he's just, he's so good at magic, which I think is kind of what they inferred in the following chapters was that he's just so good at magic. Like it's like a um, automatic defense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And we know he's really good. I mean, we talked about that last chapter, the chapter Mm -hmm. or the episode before with him mimicking the death eaters in the cafe in London where Mm -hmm. he, his instincts are that good, but this is a magic he doesn't know against a foe that he is extremely like men- psychically connected to. Maybe that's the word I need to use. It's less like they're like they are psychically connected, um, which is a sort of not hmm. a word that ever gets used in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I just yeah. I just noticed it. It the scene re- hmm. re- reads a lot like Harry's having a vision of Voldemort. It just so happens that Voldemort is literally right in front of him. Interesting. And he responds accordingly. And I know that in the later oh. in the book they talk about how Harry, Harry and Voldemort can't they can't kill each other. They both can and they can't, right? Like it's like this mm-hmm. weird thing. Anyway, I don't know. It just I just wanted to discuss it because I found it a very interesting way it was described that it could have been just like Harry, Harry as Voldemort as Harry, their mm-hmm. minds being so tightly connected that when Voldemort cast this spell, Harry also cast the spell without even being conscious of it. Honestly, that I, I like that theory, especially because he didn't know that magic. Because the only other thing I could think of would be adrenaline, which like people pick up cars and do things like that. But it's like the, you know, the mm-hmm. witches or the wizards version. But he doesn't mm-hmm. even know that magic. So I kind of dig that. Like he literally, the connection. It's almost like, it, yeah, is it like a spell that Voldemort knows? Like, does he literally yeah. pull it across Vold- from Voldemort's mind into his own to cast it as a protective enchantment against Voldemort? That's what's, that's what maybe it's like. It's like Harry's having an episode of, of seeing in Voldemort's mind. And he does magic that Voldemort probably does know because Voldemort knows just about all the magic. So I like that only because it's another way that since he connected them through um, Lily's blood, Voldemort, like, you know, kind of screws himself over again, you know, <laughs> like mm-hmm. keep underestimating what you're doing and then, you know, you die. So yeah, yeah. I dig that. Okay. okay. Good catch. Well, thanks for that. chatting through that with me. Just curious yeah. about it. We'll never know. <laughs> Maybe. All right. So what did you have? What are the lighter bits that we can wrap up this chapter with? Yeah, sure. Um, just... Let's see. First off, the reference to um, whenever um, Mad Eye Moody is talking about how they won't have the Death Eaters and Voldemort will not have guessed that Harry would split himself or would be he's be seven people. He says even you know who can't split himself into seven. 
And then Harry and Hermione kind of look to each other real quick, like, oh, but mm. can't be. <laughs> you don't know how wrong you are, Moody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then whenever Harry is surrounded by Harry's all getting naked, and he's just like, really, guys? Like, he's, you know, they're literally taking off their clothes. And imagine having to see yourself naked. You're literally, like, watching. And you're like, guys, guys, can you, like, maybe cover me up, please? Like, mm-hmm. thank you. Like, <laughs> The girls don't have boxers on, so are they taking off their pants? Like, I don't know. (laughs) I'm not sure. I remember this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie because Dan Radcliffe has to play all seven of himself as Harry, all seven Harrys. And by the way, Dan Radcliffe is fantastic at doing ridiculous things. Like we are watching, I think I mentioned it in a previous episode, we're watching Miracle Workers and Mm -hmm. the, the season on the Oregon Trail, which is the third season, he does a... Dr. Frankenfurter-esque dance in an old-timey saloon and, like, commits to the bit. And that is Dan Radcliffe. I mean, he doesn't do anything in half measures. And this scene is one of those where he's, like, he plays Fleur being all modest. Like, don't look at me, Bill. And then, you know, Harry plays – or Dan plays Harry – as Fred and as George and as Ron and all these different characters. And he does them all exactly as they would play him if they could. It's just a very incredible bit of acting. I really look forward to seeing it next week. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's such a good point. Yes. Yeah. I haven't seen the Oregon trail, but I have seen the one scene where he is in the saloon and he, uh, yeah, he goes all for it. And it is. Uh, Wait, you've seen that. Did that go around the internet? <laughs> oh yeah. No, I think we talked about it. One of the first episodes where I talked about it because I didn't know what it was called. And that was the only thing I'd seen was that YouTube clip of him, you know, at the saloon. It is committed. It is a very good piece of acting. Oh, so good. Yep. Dear friends and listeners, please Google Dan Radcliffe (laughs) Saloon, Oregon Trail. (laughs) You will be delighted. (laughs) It's really good in the context of the show because he plays a priest the entire rest of the season. (laughs) So it's like very out of character for the character. But anyway, back to Harry Potter. Amazing. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see. The line where Ron says, I knew Ginny was lying about that too, tattoo. So I'm like, what is Ginny teasing her poor brother Ron about that she has seen a tattoo on Harry's chest, meaning that they have been in some kind of circumstance where Harry does not have his shirt on. Do you it's not remember this scene in Half-Blood Prince? Wait, No. Yeah, I don't think I can pull it up that quickly because I don't, I literally haven't read Half-Blood Prince in a while, but there's a scene where Ginny and Harry and Ron and Lavender and Hermione, I believe Hermione's in the scene, she might not be because Lavender's there, are all sitting near the fire Mm -hmm. and Ron and Lavender, I think, are making out and for some reason they start talking about Harry having a chest tattoo of a hippogriff and it like, and if I remember correctly, the way it's described is that all of a sudden a squelching noise came from the direction of Ron and Lavender as Ron whipped around to be like, Ginny, how do you know? It's a scene. We're going to get into it. We're going to get there. <laughs> okay. I don't remember that at all. That is so mm-hmm. funny. I love that. Yeah. Oh, I love Ginny. Mm. That's where it comes from is all this time Ron has been obsessing that his best friend who he's shared a dorm with for six years and has surely seen change his shirt right. has a tattoo he doesn't know about. <laughs> That's what I think is funny. I was like, does it, don't they change in front of each other? Especially shirts. Anyways, yeah, maybe they didn't have a chance <laughs> after that. But anyways, um, yeah. And then one more small thing is I found it interesting that both Tonks and Hermione didn't want to be on broomsticks. So mm-hmm. it just kind of it's like, oh, are most women girls not as good on broomsticks? You know, on, on yeah, average, Flora doesn't as well, right? Yeah. Flora also doesn't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. It's, I didn't uh, Hermione that. and Flora, not Tonks. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. 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 That's interesting. I, I don't know. I don't know that there's any data. I mean, we know there are great Quidditch players who are women, right? Angelina Johnson. Of course. And, yeah. Uh, Katie and Ginny. But yeah, I like to think that Hermione doesn't like being on a broom because she doesn't like the sense that she's not in complete control. And the broom is a little bit of a leap of faith to fly. Like it's mm. not, it's not a sense of secure travel. Like you're flying through the air. The broom can do crazy things. So that's my, that's always been my understanding is like, you can't learn it in a book is how they say it in the first, in the first book. That's why Hermione doesn't like it. Fleur, I don't know. She's mm. more proper than a broomstick. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. That's all I had. Good observation though. I didn't catch, I didn't really think of it in terms of that though. I do have a gendered Con- comment content that I caught in this for the first time ever that we are going to discuss when we get there. 
Okay, I think I think it's in the next I know chapter. What you're so about. let's move on to the yes. next chapter. <laughs> I think I saw that too. Okay, yeah. Chapter three: The Dursleys departing. It is minutes before the Dursleys are supposed to leave Pivot Drive after being instructed to do so for their safety. Vernon has decided that he no longer wants to leave, claiming that it's a ploy for Harry to sell their house in this great market. After minutes of convincing them that they need to leave or be tortured by Voldemort, it is Dudley who seals the deal by announcing he wants to go with the wizards for safety. When Hestia and Diggle arrive to take the Dursleys away, the goodbye only shows us and outsiders how much more incredibly awful the Dursleys have been to Harry not understanding what he has been through or how big of a deal he is to everyone. However, in the end, Dudley is the only one to show us a slight change of heart by giving Harry somewhat of a nice goodbye and in his own very special way. And I love you. Very nice. Very accurate. And we're gonna, I'm sure we're going to talk about the Dursleys. <laughs> the final sentence of this chapter is, Petunia stopped and looked back. For a moment, Harry had the strangest feeling that she wanted to say something to him. She gave an odd, tremulous look and seemed to teeter on the edge of speech, but then, with a little jerk of her head, she bustled out of the room after her husband and son. Mm. I know it's at the end, but what do you think she wanted to say? Like, I'm I sorry was just I thinking stopped? that. We... <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. I've always kind of, I mean, it's very well written to leave that little mm -hmm. gem of curiosity there. Is it something to do with Lily? Is it take care of yourself? Is it, I'm sorry? No idea. No idea. I've never right. been able to come up with an idea that felt like it would really fit who Petunia is. And I almost wonder if it could be, maybe she realizes she's rotten and she wants to somehow explain her bias all the way back. And it's like, you look back and you're like, I, there's no explaining all this hate I have in my heart and how it all came out on you and the loss of my sister and all this stuff. I, Maybe I'm giving her probably get too much credit, but I kind of just wonder. Yeah, she just, I don't know. Um, there is actually a clip though. Have you seen it uh, that they took out that they were going to have um, for the seventh? Yeah, in, in the sixth, right, seventh movie um, mm -hmm. that has, it's like a, I think Petunia turns around and says, she was my sister too, you know, and then like walks out the door or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hmm. maybe J.K. Rowling. Got maybe that's to write what. That? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. Maybe that's what J.K. Rowling had in mind, and they actually filmed it, and then they decided they didn't want to include it. Um, I've always found that Petunia is a little mystifying, and I actually really look forward to following her thread back now that we have her childhood explanation of her character and we can move backward in time, like when Harry gets in trouble with the ministry and Dumbledore sends a letter telling her that she cannot. What's interesting is she cannot kick Harry out. Vernon has tried to get Harry to leave in that scene. And uh, I think it's Order of the Phoenix. And mm -hmm. the letter comes for Petunia. and Because Petunia is the key. Petunia is the only part of the bloodline, right? Yeah. She's Lily's blood. She's Harry's blood. And so it's actually Petunia who must have made the decision to keep the baby. And Petunia, who keeps him in the house. And Petunia, who's the last one to leave him in the house. So they have a connection they never really acknowledge. And she has, just like with Snape, I think that critical piece of Harry having Lily's eyes is very hard for the people who did love Lily, even if they love Lily in a way that didn't feel like love to Lily or feel like love to them, right? Because Petunia has not been friendly to her sister. We've, we've talked about that. But still, every time she looks at her nephew, she has to see her sister. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess so. That does make sense. So all the hate she had for Lily is put on to Harry and mm -hmm. Snape loves Lily so much that he hates Harry. <laughs> like, Yeah, well, I think with, with to me, Petunia is not, it, her hate is very interesting because it's more internalized. It, it, she actually hates herself right. for not being special. And so she compensates with this incredibly dull man and this mundane suburban life that she, she can't handle any disruption to because it threatens and exposes the fact that she is not special. And that comes out as neglecting, just like she neglects Lily when she walks away and goes back to their parents on the train platform. Yeah. It's the same thing she does to Harry. She, she leaves him. She abandons him, even though she, he's living in the house with them. 
And Vernon's just not a nice dude and is happy to take up the charge of being abusive. Well, and I think, did you notice that we were right where we thought it was, we were curious, like, is it Petunia pulling the strings? And in this chapter, I feel like we see it is her pulling the strings because you can see him talking Mm -hmm. and like, she's like nodding her head or looking over at him. Like she's, she's pulling the strings where I think Vernon didn't come up with those ideas on his own. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure not. I'm sure just like we discussed last episode with Molly Weasley laying in bed, giving Arthur (laughs) a earful, uh, Petunia probably leads many of the conversations or, Vernon just knows that happy wife, happy life and never makes a decision without Petunia. Also, it's interesting that with, you know, I believe in the scene where when Dudley finally decides I'm going, I'm afraid, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in trouble. Um, If it says if his, okay, if Dudley was frightened enough to accept the order's help, his parents would accompany him. They would, there was, there could be no question of being separated from their diddykins. Vernon doesn't call Dudley Diddykins, Petunia does. And that's the, the indication. If, if Dudley's going, Petunia's going. And if Petunia's going, Vernon's going. True. True. Very true. Yeah. You know what I didn't notice? Uh, Dudley, sorry, you're saying Dudley. Dudley's muscular. Mm-hmm. By this point, he's a he's a big fit dude. You know, we don't really see that in mm-hmm. the movies. I mean, he's not, He's he looks fine, but he's not like a big muscle guy. It's not how I would have described the Dudley in the movies. Um Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, so he like he literally packs away his um his dumbbells. <laughs> yep, and his puppy fat has turned into poundage, I believe is yeah. how it gets described <laughs> at one point. Um this actually brings me really nicely into the point I wanted to make that was a gendered comment is that mm. um there's a point where Dudley's confused about what's going on and Uncle Vernon and Aunt Petunia froze where they stood, staring at Dudley as though he had just expressed a desire to become a ballerina. And I'm like, if Dudley wants to be a ballerina. That's that great. sounds fine to me. That'd be fascinating, right? Like he can totally do that. I support oh, yeah. the ballerina. Especially if he's like he's strong enough, he can hold up yeah. any ballerina. Yeah, exactly. 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 That's, I know we don't really talk about JK Rowling's thoughts about gender, but now that it has become part of the public consciousness of the Harry Potter series, I have a, I have a sense I will catch even those little things that weren't written that way, but which kind of reveal the dichotomy that is present in her mind even if she wasn't fully articulated in her philosophy of gender mm-hmm. as she wrote this book and these books. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that kind of comes out in Umbridge as well, because Umbridge likes all things pinks and cats and all these things that, I mean, frankly, I love, um, but somehow that becomes like a bad thing. So mm-hmm. anyways, yeah. mm-hmm. we've talked a lot about women, women have, and the patterns in the women characters in this series. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Good catch. I like that. I mean, I don't like that she did it, but I like that she got it. <laughs> I know. A lot of times when I'm reading or we're talking, I think about how I wish we had lots of fans and followers. So people would do fan art and they would do Dudley the Ballerina as fan art. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be great? We yeah. could commission it. If we ever get popular, oh. we'll get an artist and we'll commission it like one, one or two pieces per book of things we discussed. That's going to be one of them. Okay. Because I, I feel that. like, I feel like people grow to like Dudley, right? We grow to like Dudley. He, right. he, de- he develops an astonishing amount as a character considering where he starts and the parents he's being raised by and how little their characters develop in the series. And it would be delightful to see Dudley the ballerina imagined on like a print that we could sell for people who wanted to uh, start a podcast. I love that. Oh, that's such a good idea. I am here for it. And I want him to be like kind of cute, right? He's got to be kind of handsome because I feel like he grows up to be handsome mm-hmm. despite his, you know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Muscly. Ball- oh, I love it. Okay. <laughs> okay he's in a tutu by the way it's he's fully in it he's not like Obviously. a male ballerina oh no i was picturing like ballerina. pink, pink oh, yeah. and yeah. yeah 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 okay we've yeah. got an idea this is we're gonna have to go with this okay yes. yeah <laughs> that, Do you that have was all i had this chapter no okay i have one more thing and it is related to dudley which is good i'm gonna just keep an eye i didn't get i didn't i didn't well i didn't literally think i could go through and double check this actual fact but I feel like the scene as Harry and Dudley say goodbye to each other is one of the rare times they call each other by their preferred names. So Dudley mm. says, see you, Harry. Harry says, yep, maybe take care big D. Mm-hmm. And that is the first time they actually address each other almost as equals. And I'm just going to try and keep an eye on that as we move backward to see if that truly is the first time that they speak with any sense of affection, a familial affection between the two of them. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. I don't know. Um, and I we may have talked about it before, but supposedly, according uh, according to the author, they do keep in touch in later years. Like they they send each other like Christmas cards and stuff like that. So they mm-hmm. are at, at the least like friendly and cordial, which um, which is a big step for you know people mm-hmm. that tortured kind of tortured each other. Eventually, Harry kind of actually I feel like he always tortured him, even if it was just out of like protection. He still like had his own way of making fun of them. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why I think I, I want to kind of keep an eye on that because I do think it is one of the it is the first time they speak as equals, and it may be one of the first times Dudley ever calls him Harry, mm. like an right. entire series. I'm not sure how often he says his name because they're I, just the two of them in a scene. They're not going to say each other's names. So anyway, I think I'll you're right. I think you might write. Love it. Okay. All right, let's step back in time. One more chapter. Chapter two, in memoriam. Harry is at Pivot Drive cleaning out his trunk and packing to leave. He first finds an article by Elpheus Dodge, a eulogy for Albus Dumbledore. He recounted Dumbledore's life, a bright wizard from a young age, receiving every award possible at Hogwarts. He was a champion for Muggleborns and was ready to travel the world when he had to take care of his family after his mother passed away tragically. The same paper has an article about Rita Skeeter in her new book, The Lies of Albus Dumbledore. Shining a not-so-bright light on Dumbledore, talking of a teen who dabbled in dark arts, hated muggles, and had an unhealthy interest in Harry Potter. Yep, that is what happens. And that, well, right at the end, Harry looks into a sliver of Sirius's old mirror and sees a piercing blue eye. And that leads into the final sentence, which reads, if anything was certain, it is that the bright blue eyes of Albus Dumbledore would never pierce him again. Hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't have a ton in these two chapters, actually, to wrap it up. I really, it goes pretty quickly here because I think, well, especially the next chapter, which is totally different setting, totally different set of characters. This chapter is an information dump to lay the foundation for the rest of the book, right? We Mm -hmm. need all this information about these two sides of the potential life and lives of Albus Dumbledore so that we understand Harry's journey to make sense of Dumbledore the entire rest of the book. And so I don't actually have a ton here. Um... Let's yeah, see. me either. Oh, one thing I did notice right away, and I totally agree with, it's uh, somewhat reassuring to see that the magical world doesn't educate their children in practical magic any better than we educate our humans in the muggle world on practical <laughs> yeah. muggle knowledge. I was like, oh, they don't know how to do, you know, healing spells? Yeah, we don't know how to balance a checkbook or keep a savings <laughs> account open. <laughs> like, that sounds about right. School needs to teach what people need to know. Admittedly, Harry's education in particular was unlikely to teach him that skill because of umbrage. And her whole, you know, gaslighting campaign of there not being any reason for students to know how to protect themselves or heal themselves or anything like that. But I don't like bringing up Umbridge because she she just makes me mad. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and maybe, I don't know, maybe simple things like that, like that was, maybe they didn't want kids doing that kind of magic because then they're going to end up in the hospital ward with like a deeper gash or something, you know, like they just couldn't be trusted Mm -hmm. with like bodily stuff. Right. And I don't even think Hermione knows that spell, actually. This part never comes up. So Harry says he makes a mental note to ask Hermione, mm-hmm. but Hermione always uses Essence of Dittany to heal all their wounds. She never uses a spell. She uses a potion or a potion-making product. So I think it That's is a very advanced magic. It's a, yeah. it's a career that you would go and train for, just like going to med school. But I just love that Harry was like, they don't teach me anything practical. <laughs> like, <laughs> we have the same problem in the muggle world. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um. So what about, so I noticed that I think it's possible that whenever the locket, um, R.A.B.'s locket, I didn't realize it was slightly meaningful to Harry. Like he kind of, page 14, he actually talks about how he kept it in the front of his knapsack as a reminder of what it cost him, which would be Dumbledore. And although it was meaningful and maybe more of a, not sadistic, but kind of a sad way, um, it was meaningful to him when he gave it to Creature. I thought it was like, oh, it's here's this locket, take it. But it was kind of the last mm-hmm. reminder of Dumbledore. So it was meaningful when he gave it mm-hmm. to the picture. Yeah. He could only pay it as a price when the, when the, when the thing he was going to get for that, for giving up the locket was worth it. Right. Like that's how I think about it. Like they, he pays a heavy price for it. So when he finally gives it up, it has to be for something that is going to compensate him emotionally and psychologically, which is the the loyalty of creature. That's yeah. basically what it buys him. If you think of it transactionally, because yeah, it is, 
in the film, the Half Blood Prince film, it's in Dumbledore's hand when he falls from the tower. And so Harry literally takes it from the body of Dumbledore. Mm -hmm. And that is why he keeps it is because it's like, I can never forget Dumbledore died for this stupid locket that doesn't even mean anything. But then when it's shown that it's a valuable to creature and creature is willing to be a loyal, you know, house elf for Harry, he's able to see like, I did buy it at a great cost, but that actually gets me something too, which is creature's loyalty, which is something Dumbledore was always trying to teach us that we could treat these creatures with humanity. <laughs> if anyone was wondering, uh, you do what you had a major or a minor in psychology, correct? I feel like that's really showing in this a, chapter. <laughs> I have a master's in psychology. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. I, I can never exactly. Majors, yeah. I majored and I have a master's in clinical psychology. <laughs> Every so often I just pull a little, pull a little bit of that. Thanks okay. for that student loans that I'm still paying off. <laughs> Sometimes if you're watching the YouTube and you see my eyes get real big, it's because I'm like, well, I, I don't know what to add to this because she's literally <laughs> said it all and there's not smart enough to even go deeper into that. So it's, yeah, we got our, <laughs> she's an well, encyclopedia sure have... <laughs> and she's a psychi psychologist. I love it. With a lot of student loans. That is the the price that I have paid. <laughs> yeah, well, don't we all? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Okay. So should we start talking about, so first off, we have um, Elpheus Doge. Are we saying Doge, like Dogecoin? Uh, okay. Doge properly, yep. Doge, okay. Uh, so his his account of Dumbledore is, he was a very studious guy. Like whenever he was describing Dumbledore, to me, it reminded me a mix of Harry and Hermione because he's super smart, academic. He gets all the awards. Um, people really like him. He's his, he's his own legend, which I feel like kind of reminds me of Harry. Like he, he's a protector of the weak. He, you know, that's, that's, that's his account of him. Um, but, you know, obviously the Rita Skeeter is completely different, but I don't know. I pictured Harry and Hermione and then maybe Ron was more like his brother. And that's why he was able to understand Ron was because, oh, this is probably looking back as an adult, you can, especially you know, in your hundreds, you can probably like, okay, this is probably how my brother felt like in my shadow or, you know, even Doge is like, oh, even as he's even being his friend, I felt like I was in his shadow sometimes. Mm -hmm, like he, maybe mm -hmm. he was able to understand Ron that way, but he understood Harry and Hermione so much because he basically was them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really interesting observation. I've never caught that before. I find this whole, uh, what do they call it? Eulogy. This whole, this whole eulogy basically is a very interesting piece of uh, revisionist history, basically. <laughs> I mean, just as Rita Skaters is revisionist history in another direction. Yeah. Uh, this is the rosiest possible tinted examination of Dumbledore's life. It in fact has factual inaccuracies because, you know, Doge claims that Dumbledore never showed the slightest indication of anti-muggle tendencies. And we learned later that is actually untrue. And there are people alive who can verify it. Uh, however, it gives this, like I said, it gives a really nice foundation, but I do like how you, you kind of garnered from this that Dumbledore would have really good insight into the, the big three in each of their characters because of his own life and seeing the impact that his life had on his family and his friends. That's probably part of why he advocated for Ron to become a prefect because Everyone yeah. thought it would be Harry and Dumbledore says, well, I thought you had enough to be going on, getting on with, but also giving Ron a piece of something that made him feel special was important. It's so what important. Aberforth never got from his brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. I'm sure that would have made a huge difference to Aberforth. Mm -hmm. To be recognized yeah. as unique and special and important to his own brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I really like the scene in between the two. Yeah, after the eulogy, but before Rita Skeeter's interview, where Harry gets this first glimpse that we all do of the parents and the adults in our lives and realizing that their lives began long before we knew them. Mm -hmm. I think that that is a very interesting fact of human nature and humankind that when we're born and we're young, we have no concept of age and we have no concept of aging and the idea that our parents were once kids and were once young and married or whatever your family situation might be. And we all get to a point where we realize that they were, and mm -hmm. it sort of like throws us into disarray, realizing we will never know them fully mm -hmm. because 
there's a, one, there's an imbalance in the relationship. They are a parent like figure or a parent. And two, there's just a whole life there that has so much context and color. We'll never understand as the next generation down, or in this case, a couple generations down. I just, I really liked that. I liked that Harry lamented that a little bit, even as he made, he understood. And especially by the end of this book, he understands why Dumbledore is obsessively focused with Harry. He has to be, he knows Harry's the only one who can stop this. Yeah. But Harry still throughout the book wishes he'd gotten to know Dumbledore at all and is, you know, lucky enough to have one final conversation with him. Mm, That's true. And I think that is a common thing that can happen with people, you know, maybe a grandparent, you know, you just don't see them that way. And if they happen to die, you know, maybe too young in your life, you don't get a chance to ask them fun questions or interesting questions or get to know them in a different way other than more you focused, right? Whenever they're that mm-hmm. much older than mm-hmm. you, they just want to, they want to dote on you. They want to be focused on you. Although maybe Dumbledore didn't dote on him, but you know what I mean? He, they just, they focus mm-hmm. on you. It's, it's a one way street for the most part until, you know, you get old enough to be interested in a different way. Yeah. 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 yeah I like that too. You know, I, I had a little more empathy for Dumbledore and I, I imagine you did too. And a lot of, I don't know if our, a lot of the listeners are like us and we love to travel. Dumbledore is, you know, high on life. He's very smart. He's obviously popular. We're assuming that the eulogy has some truths to it. He probably is popular. He is smart. He gets awards. People like him. He's, he's got a bright future ahead of him. He has his best friend, which we could assume, I mean, they may have just been best friends or maybe there was a little bit more like, cause they even said in his eulogy, there was a mutual attraction there from the beginning. Whether that just means as friends or as lovers, I'm not sure. But regardless, you have this whole future ahead of you. You're going to go with your best friend. You're about to travel the world, which is like the dream, right? They're going to, they're taking a year abroad, you know, taking a year about instead of gap year, gap year. Exactly. Which we are not taught in America, which is a (laughs) ripoff. Did not know (laughs) that. Um, Australia has it right. Almost everybody uh, takes a gap year when they're 18. Anyways, he's going to do that. He's about to go do all of these really cool things that Doge gets gets to go do and talks about. And I mean, I would be upset too. Like, yeah, not only do you have the grief of your own mother dying, but now instead of having this really cool future ahead of you, you're stuck at home taking care of your brother who you really don't get along with and taking care of your sister who's like the family's like dirty secret. You know what I mean? That he mm-hmm. loves, but it's like this huge burden. Like that, that sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think a lo- I thought a lot about that when I was reading this section about how I wondered what the context was of Ariana's getting so mad that she has her magical incident that ends up with Kendra's death. Um, I have a couple thoughts. One, you know, is it Dumbledore's graduation? Graduations are very stressful for families. They are mm-hmm. celebratory, but they're also huge transitional times, huge, huge, huge transitional times. And so I wonder if that might have played a role. I also think I thought about, you know, who... F- figured it out like who found Ariana at home and Kendra's body to notify her sons that she had died so there's a lot of context in that scene that I kind of wondered about right because you know it is a big deal it's a big deal in the family that Dumbledore has to take up the mantle of parent Um, and Mm -hmm. there's something that led to that you know I almost I think it's interesting that Dumbledore Albus claims that Aberforth has to finish his, finish his education when he, when Aberforth asks to drop out to take care of Ariana, because it would have been a totally different situation if that had just been something they came to an agreement on, because they're both now like, they have no parents. They get to make these decisions on their own. Um, yeah. It would have permitted Dumbledore Albus to do his gap year, to continue his meteoric rise, which actually as a quick aside, I think it's funny how everyone assumes in the magical world that if you're really, really good at everything, you're going to end up being in government. Because <laughs> I know people who are really good at everything don't end up in government. I mean, no. I guess maybe they end up president. Maybe like that's what the minister of magic is. But I'm like, uh, if I'm that talented, I'm not going to be minister. I got no. things to do. <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, I feel like everyone does. Harry, her mind, like they all do at first go into government. Like, that's, like that's, that's, I mean, that's not the only job, but it's clearly the the biggest employer of magical people. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's the highest paying. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, All right. You have anything else in this chapter? Um, 
I just thought there was a funny line where it says Doge can get off his high hippogriff. It's uh, Rita Skeeter talking about <laughs> him. I just thought that was funny. She has a lot of really good alliterations in that interview. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Nope, that's all I had. What about you? Okay, that's it. That's it. Now we just, I, I'm going to like mark this moment because we are moving into the first and final chapter of Deathly Hollows, And I, wow. I feel like I can't just be like, let's move on to the next chapter because we have been doing this for 14 weeks. We have read 700 pages and now we finally approach the conclusion, which is like many of the books in a completely different setting and context. And so doesn't yeah. actually fit the way that the chapter we just discussed does. So mm -hmm. anyway, on that note, let's, <laughs> let's hit the hit the final and first chapter. Okay. Chapter one, The Dark Lord Ascending. The beginning of the book takes place at Malfoy Manor. Snape and Yaxley, the last to arrive at a meeting with Voldemort and the highest of his Death Eaters. They are debating the next steps and when Harry Potter will be taken from his house before his mother's protection or Dumbledore's protection no longer covers him at Pivot Drive. Snape assures him the date that they will leave the house is Saturday, and despite other opinions, Yaxley's, about when it will happen, Voldemort decides to believe Snape. They discuss taking over the ministry, and Voldemort has finally understood that it is him who must kill Potter. Very nice. And this is the final sentence, though. It isn't really that strong of a final sentence to be the final sentence, but it is the final sentence, and I just read what's in the book. Dinner, Nagini, said Voldemort softly, and the great snake swayed and slithered from his shoulders onto the polished wood. We don't need to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dark scene. If you don't know what we're talking about, you need to go back and read the book. That's just all it is. Join us in the backwards reading of the book. Yes, please. Okay, I don't have very many notes in this chapter, uh, but I do have, I think, what are some, I think they're important ones. Okay. Um, go for it. The first one is about legitimacy and occlumency. It's okay. the scene where Snape has just told Voldemort it's going to be Saturday next. And Voldemort looks at Snape mm -hmm. and they are having a battle yes. of wills. And I was just not less curious about, like, we know Snape is a proficient legitimacy. He's an excellent occlumency. He can protect his mind. But I thought about the way that the two magics are portrayed. So when Harry's learning occlumency, how he experiences it is like Snape, and like he's entering his mind, like he like whoop, tunnels into a memory. Mm -hmm. So presumably on Snape's end, Snape experiences the memory and Harry experiences the memory. Now, when you're deploying occlumency, what is that experience? Because it seems mm -hmm. like it should be like bl black brick wall. You're not getting in here, which means that when Snape is using occlumency, Voldemort knows he's using occlumency. Because he's keeping him out of his mind. So maybe occlumency is different. And because Harry's so bad at it, we never know how it actually works. Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that occlumency must be the case that Snape can just like focus really tightly on it, what he wants Voldemort to see. Yeah. And when Voldemort looks into his mind, then he sees what Snape wants him to see. That's the only way I can make sense of this scene. I, I do think you're right. I think that's exactly what happens. I think he's so talented and he's able to, it's almost like telling a half truth where he he, he got the information from his source and he just shows him the parts that matter, the bits that make it seem true. You know, he obviously mm -hmm. doesn't let him in enough to know that he's the one who then planted the seven potters into Mundungus's mind. Or like, I think he just, he must just show him. Yeah. The bits that collaborate, collaborate his story. Yeah, it must be the case that the occlumency, the level of occlumency they're trying to teach Harry is more advanced than what Snape has to use against Voldemort. Because mm -hmm. Harry needs to protect his entire mind. Snape yeah. only has to protect parts of his mind. He could just has to be able to be like, Voldemort can go this way and that way in my brain, but not see these other things I don't want him to see. Like how much I love Lily, that I'm still talking to D Dumbledore's portrait, that I have the, that I know so much, all that information. Anyway. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting because that's a magic that is highly unexplored because Harry mm -hmm. sucks at it. Yet it's <laughs> very important, even in this scene, that Snape has that ability to mm -hmm. protect his mind against Voldemort. Yeah. No, I, again, I can go for on for hours. Snape is an insanely talented wizard. Mm -hmm. Very underrated. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, good catch. What do you have in this chapter? Sure. You know, the main thing I have, it's actually, if you have children, maybe don't listen to this, but um, it's not, it's not gonna be bad, but it's like, you know, questionable. 
Um, so it's about Bellatrix and Voldemort again. And mm-hmm. page nine. I like that too. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of even gross to say because it is very kind of gringy. But she there, Voldemort is talking to the Malfoys about how, oh, do you not like having me here at your house? I've seen the way the faces you make. I've read your mind, basically. I know you hate it. And Bellatrix, and I think the description is like her basically heaving her breasts onto the table and she's trying to reach, trying to get to Voldemort to be as close as possible, like deep gasping the way, oh, go ahead. You're going to read it? Mere words could not demonstrate her longing for closeness. Yeah. I I would oh. never have picked up on that dynamic that you pointed out at the very end of the book, <laughs> aka the beginning of the season. I never caught that. I never caught the sexual undertones in that section. It is so evident to me that whatever is going on for Bellatrix, at least, is beyond the devotion of yeah. the average Death Eater. <laughs> and poor Rodolphus, who has not yet been taken out during the battle, is just sitting there like, my wife and this dark lord and i can't even say anything because it's the dark lord and he feeds people to his snake so <laughs> he's gotta go with it. that's what happens in cults though if you think oh. about the death eaters kind of like a cult mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it is evident like a lot of times cult leaders will abuse their power over mm-hmm. members of the other gender to in you know get more of what they want whatever that might be i'm kind of keeping it suitable for work here suitable for kids ears uh that's kind of the dynamic here in these three characters, Rodolphus, we never actually see and Bellatrix who wants to be, she wants more power. She wants to support this cult leader, AKA the dark yeah. Lord Voldemort and Voldemort like, whatever, you, nobody can do anything about it. Cause I'm in charge here and everybody knows it. One, well, maybe it'd be like an honor, like Rodolphus to be like, yeah, that's my way mm-hmm. with the dark. Lord. In cults, a lot of times in cults, a lot of times that's the case. If your mm-hmm. partner is picked to be the partner of the cult leader, you are elevated in your stature as well. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Okay, so what she says is she says, no higher pleasure. No higher pleasure, repeated Voldemort, his head tilted a little to one side as he considered Bellatrix. That means a great deal, Bellatrix, from you. I'm like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) sorry, I just had to get that out. Mm -hmm. So gross. So gross. It's so Mm -hmm. cringy. It just made me think there was something going on. I'm just saying there was something going on. Yeah, or some she wanted something to be going on. If it wasn't going on, because I always read Voldemort's responses as like, it's almost like in the scene in the forest at the very end of the book when Voldemort looks at Harry and he says like, he almost looked like a curious child, uncertain what would happen next. That's almost how Voldemort always sort of responds to Bellatrix with these like expressive sentiments she puts forward. Like he's like, curious, hmm. Whatever. Like, he doesn't really engage her that way. Yeah. But I think she wants whatever he's got to offer with his snake-like face and gross. Don't talk about <laughs> it. <laughs> oh, it's kind of like Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. He's like, I don't really quite understand what you're coming at with me with this sexual tension, but let's let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, yep. That was my main takeaway from the chapter. It really grossed me out. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for grossing us out as we fin- wrap up our finale. Uh, the only other thing I had is uh, <laughs> is the scene. Well, it's part of this whole, it's this all one scene. It's where Voldemort says, I have been careless and so have been thwarted by luck and chance, those records of all but the best laid plans. But I know better now. I understand things that I did not before. I must be the one to kill Harry Potter and I shall be. And then he's basically like, I get things. I understand them. Give me your wand, Lucius, which is not the issue. He does not understand, which is something you said very, very early on in this season. Voldemort underestimates anything he doesn't understand. He doesn't even try to understand most of this. He is like, this is going to be super nerdy. I got to use this analogy because I can't think of a better one and I might cut it out. But for those people who know what search engine optimization is, (laughs) when they're like, it's got to be a technical issue. It's got to be the wand. And you're like, it's not the wand. It's the magic. And you're not willing to look at the magic. And that is Voldemort. He's not willing to look at the magic because he doesn't believe that that he's like, I know everything. I know all the magics. So it can be that I don't know magic. It has to be that my wand is not the right tool for the job. And it's like, no. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. You know what? I didn't even think of it that way. And that's honestly so true. He's literally just trying to overcompensate. He's like, no, I've got it. I've got it now. It's my fault. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm impressed. He Mm -hmm. kind of took blame. Uh, But yeah, (laughs) That's a very good. I've got it now. It's the wand. (laughs) He spends the entire book 
obsessing over the wand and it's not the no. wand no wand there is no wand ever literally that he can find that will do what he's asking it to do it is the magic right. and he refuses to realize that that could be that, that could be the reality which is why he loses the end down <laughs> not kidding <laughs> no that was a good ending honestly i have nothing else wow <laughs> yeah i don't either i don't either i have removed all but that very first sticky note in my book my book will now retire to the shelf until I need to reference it in future episodes, which probably won't wow. need to because it's now fresh in a new way. And uh, well, I guess with that, we will wrap it up. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, obviously we have one more episode next week. That will be our film discussion True. of the two Deathly Hallows films. So we're not totally done, but just to give you a little preview, next week we have a normal episode talking about films. We're going to have a special guest. I don't think I know who it is yet. I think Bray's been working on that. So it'll be a surprise for everyone. And (laughs) then we're going to take a break. We're going to take a month, the month of April, 2022 off. So if you are discovering us after these episodes have just gone live, uh, that is why there is a gap. We are doing that by design to give ourselves time for our creative coffers to refill, to work on other projects, to get re-inspired because podcasting is both fun and challenging, especially when it's your first one, like this is for us. And given that it's our first podcast, I would like to say thank you for sticking with us this long. Mm -hmm. And we would really appreciate your feedback. So if you would like to give us a review or a rating or both, you can do so. Apple has that. We hear Spotify is soon to have those features too. So you may have them in your app if you're listening on Spotify. And that feedback is really, really important. It is actually literally what makes podcasts succeed or or not. (laughs) Um, You know, all of the algorithms look at that. Google looks at that as they evaluate websites and what order to put them in on their search results. Like it's very important. So if you have listened and you have not yet left us a review, we would really appreciate that. And uh, you can also find us on social media, right, Brie? Yep. Uh, Bell Jar Pod on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Give us a shout out. DM us. Say hello. I will reply back or Valerie. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happy. Share on your stories. I will share it back. We want to hear from you. Give us a shout out. Yep. And and then if you have private feedback that you don't feel comfortable leaving in a review, Mm -hmm. maybe that feedback is you guys suck. I would rather receive that (laughs) by email. So send me an email at podcast at follow the butterflies.com. Follow the butterflies.com is my Harry Potter website. Uh, there is a ton more Harry Potter stuff there. If you love Harry Potter so much, you don't get enough of it from the hours that you spend with us each week. So you can head over there. You can find there's a podcast page in the menu bar. You can send emails. You can sign up for emails. All that good stuff is there. And with that, we will wrap it up for this week. So we'll see you next week. Yeah. See ya.